Uh, we are uh, starting off with the first panel. And as you see at the agenda, um, I'll be co-moderating co it with Judge Timaike. We have four panelists who will cover specific convention issues and specific rights. But I will take a couple of minutes just to tell you how panels will work and, and really invite your questions from now onwards. Uh, panelists will speak in turn for roughly 10 minutes each, um, and we aim to leave half an hour uh, for questions that come from the region. Those questions can either be communicated to your moderators in the room as the presentations go on, and they will email them forwards, or you can use the platform and communicate them through the chat box on the platform. Obviously, with close to 250 participants over eight hubs and just as many those who are watching us online, we won't be able to answer every question. But what we will try and do is, is focus on those that have been raised several times and clearly uh, there is a lot of interest in the region in those. Tim Eike who is co-moderating with me, is judge um, who elected in respect of United Kingdom in 2016, now vice president of the section. Um, but for us at the Air Center, more importantly, the first ever intern of the Air Center, um, who then um, later sat on our board of directors and uh, who has exactly two decades ago been in the Balkans with me. Um, so we're very, very glad to be bringing you back uh, to the Balkans again, if virtually this time. Um, and I hope you'll be able to travel before long. Panelists um, who are uh, joining us uh, today all have very clear links um, with the region. We have uh, Judge Ilyevsky and Judge Jelic uh, elected in respect of Macedonia, North Macedonia, and Montenegro, respectively. We have Belgium judge Paul Lemons, who has, however, for four years, served on UNMIC uh, Human Rights Advisory Body. Um, so he's very familiar with the issues in the region. And lastly, we have um, our colleague and friend, former judge Lady Bianco, uh, now professor, associate professor at Strasbourg University, um, who really back in 2013, over lunch with Judge Popovic, um, who was then judge in respect of Serbia, um, came up with this whole concept uh, uh, with us. Um, and, and so he is a godparent of this forum. Um, he can't possibly give up on us, and I'm delighted that, that he's here every year and today as well. So with this, I will pass on to Tim, um, and we can start with our panel. Thank you very much, Mirjana. It's a, a great pleasure to be back in the Balkans, even if only virtually. And as you said, it will be a great pleasure to travel there again when we are able to. Um, as you've heard, the, the, I've been instructed to keep relatively tight ship in relation to timing. Um, even though my contributors have already indicated that um, they might expect some leniency. We will see how that goes. But um, the title of the first panel is um, Convention Rights Affected by COVID-19 Pandemic and by States' Responses to the Pandemic, um, including the discussion of positive and negative obligations on states. But we're starting with two contributions which look at the positive obligations of states. And we heard this morning from Judge Spano, our president, about the obligations the states derive from their positive obligations. And this will, we hope, set a context for the topics we will have about the negative obligations and the interferences uh, or possible interferences and responses thereto in the rest of this morning's panel and this afternoon's panel. So I think without further ado, I will um, first invite my colleague, Jovan Ilyevsky, the current judge elected in respect of North Macedonia, to talk to you about positive obligations in relation to the right of life. 
Jovan, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Dear colleagues and friends, uh, Article 2 contains two substantive uh, obligations. The general obligation to protect by law the right to life and the prohibition of in intentional deprivation of life. The second obligation, which is the prohibition of intentional taking of life, is limited by the list of exceptions in Article 2, Paragraph 2 of the Convention. In addition to, to these substantive obligations, Article 2 of the Convention also contains a procedural obligation to conduct an effective investigation into alleged uh, violations of a substantive part of it. The positive obligation of the state not only to refrain from the intentional and unlawful taking of life, but also to take appropriate step, steps to safeguard the lives of those within its jurisdiction uh, has uh, two aspects. The first is the duty to provide a regulatory framework and the second is the, the obligation to take preventive operational measures. The court has found that the positive obligations derived from Article 2 in a number of different contexts, as detailed in the guide, uh, but given our topic, topic and uh, the time frame, of course, I will draw your attention to the context of healthcare that uh, I will analyze through the case law of the court. In the decision of uh, Olga Kotseska and others against, in that time, uh, the for former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia, of the 22nd of October 2013, Although the case concerned an incident at a playground, the court in paragraph 50 <coughs> reiterated that, the, that Article 2 does not concern only deaths resulting from the use of force by agents of, of the state. In the first sentence of its first paragraph, it places a positive obligation on the contracting states to take appropriate steps to safeguard the lives of those within their uh, jurisdiction. Such a positive obligation has been found to arise in a range of different contexts examined so far by, by the court. For example, in the healthcare sector, be it public or private, as regards the acts or omissions of health professionals. In doing so, the court referred to the cases of Dodov against Bulgaria, Birzikovsky against Poland, and Vo against France, uh, French. France. In the case of Birzikovsky against Poland, in paragraph one, uh, 104, the court reiterates that the acts and omissions of the authorities in the field of healthcare policy may, in certain circumstances, engage their responsibility under the positive limb of Article 2. In the paragraph 105, the court noted, and I quote, however, the obligations of the state under Article 2 of the Convention will not be satisfied if the protection afforded by domestic law exists only in the theory. Above all, it must also operate effectively in practice within a time span such that the courts can complete their examination of the merits of each individual case." End of the quotation. In, this, in its decisions, Moli against Romania, Kosovo against Bulgaria, Gogdemir against Turkey, and Chakmak against Turkey, uh, the court has underlined that Article 2 of the Convention 
cannot be interpre interpreted as guaranteeing to every individual an absolute level of security in any activity in which the right to life may be at stake, in particular when the person concerned bears a degree of responsibility for the accident having exposed him, himself or herself to an unjustified danger. As for the protection of uh, uh, general population in the context, context of healthcare, the positive obligation requires states to make regu regulations compelling hospitals, whether private or public, to adopt appropriate measures for the protection of patients lives. In this connection, the state's obligation to regulate must be understood in a broader sense, which includes the duty to ensure the effective functioning of that reg regulatory framework. The regulatory duties thus encompass necessary measures to ensure implementation, including supervision and enforcement. In the Grand Chamber judgment, Lopez de Souza Fernandez against Portugal, the court found on the basis of this broader understanding of the state's obligation to provide a regulatory framework, the court has accepted that in the very exceptional circumstances, the responsibility of the state under the substan substantive limb of Article 2 of the Convention may be engaged in respect of the acts and omissions of healthcare providers. The first type of exceptional circumstances concerns a specific situation where an individual patient's life is knowingly put in danger by denial of access to life-saving emergency treatment. It does not extend to circumstances where a patient is considered to have received deficient, incorrect, or delayed treatment. The second type of exceptional circumstances arises where a systemic or structural dysfunction in hospital services results in patient being deprived of access to life-saving emergency treatment and the authorities knew about or ought to have known about that risk and failed to undertake the necessary measures to prevent that risk from materializing thus putting the patient lives, including the life of the particular pa patient concerned, in, in danger. The court is aware that on the facts, it may sometimes not be easy to distinguish between cases uh, involving mere medical negligence and those where there is a denial of uh, access to life-saving emergency treatment, particularly since there may be a combination of factors which contribute to a patient's death. However, the court reiterates at this uh, juncture that for a case to fall into the latter category, the following factors taken cumulatively must be met. Firstly, the, ex the acts and omissions of the healthcare providers must go beyond a mere error of medical negligence in so far as those healthcare providers uh, in breach of their professional obligations deny a patient emergency medical treatment despite being fully aware that the person's life is at risk if that treatment is not given. Secondly, the dysfunction at issue must be objectively and genuinely identifiable as systemic or structural in order to be attributable to the state authorities 
and must not merely uh, comprise individual instances where something may have been dysfunctional in the sense of going wrong or, or functioning badly. Thirdly, there must be a link between the dysfunction complained of and the harm uh, which the patient sustained. Finally, the dysfunction at issue must have resulted from the failure of the state to meet its obligation to provide a regulatory framework in the broader sense indicated above. In this connection, the court considered that where a contracting state has made adequate provision for securing high professional standards among uh, health professionals and the protection of the lives of patients, matters such as an error of judgment on the part of a, of a health professional or negligent coordination among uh, health professionals in the treatment of a particular patient cannot be considered sufficient of themselves to call a contracting state to account from the state standpoint of its positive obligation under Article 2 of the Convention to Protect Life. I will stop here uh, with the conclusion that the above case law is likely to be actualized in future cases that will arise as a result of the current COVID pandemic. I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Jovan, for a very concise uh, and clear summary of what is a, an area of very complex case law of, of the court, and of course, with a particular focus to healthcare. And my apologies for um, enforcing the time limit um, relatively strictly. Can I pass the floor then to um, Judge Ivana Jelic, who is um, my current colleague elected in relation to, in respect of Montenegro, and um, who is, uh, was involved in organizing this forum. So, Ivana, I give you the floor. Uh, thank you, Tim. Uh, first of all, I would like to um, thank, warmly thank to the organizers for organizing this uh, important and highly relevant event. I can say traditional one now after seven years, uh, under very challenging circumstances of pandemic. Uh, this event was supposed to be in Montenegro, as we all know, and uh, because of COVID, we had to move it here. Uh, but that doesn't mean that we are not going to come back to Montenegro, I hope, next year. So, uh, also, I would like to thank to our colleagues, national judges, and also uh, academics uh, and others uh, taking part online for their great interest, which actually motivated us to uh, keep this event uh, going on. Uh, I'm impressed with the number of uh, persons taking part uh, in hubs. It's about 250, as I'm informed, plus us here. So it's really great event. Thank you all. I'm going to try <clears throat> to share in uh, 10 minutes. And thank you, Tim, for counting as of now. Uh, 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 about, uh, yes, positive obligations of, uh, for states in the context of COVID-19 concerning Article 3. Uh, let me remind you all that the Article 3 enshrines one of the most fundamental values for democratic society, as it is emphasized in Soaring versus United Kingdom uh, back in 1989. Article 3 of the Convention states that no one shall be subjected to torture or to inhuman or degrading treatment or punishment. At only 15 words, Article 3 of the Convention is one of the shortest provisions in the Convention, but Having in mind the case law of the court, it is a very contentious one. However, despite the limited wording, the scope of Article 3 is very broad, and the factual situations which uh, have given rise to complaints to alleged violations of Article 3 range from complaints that persons in police custody have been ill-treated or that conditions of con detention were inhuman or degrading, complaints that a deportation would expose the deportee to inhuman treatment in the re uh, recipient third countries, to complain that the court have failed to protect 
National Court have failed to protect uh, victims from the abuse uh, of other uh, private individuals, etc. <clears throat> Article 3 stated in an absolute and unqualified terms, there is therefore no room for limitations by law on the provision. The unconditional terms of the Article 3 also means that there can never, under the Convention or under international law, be a justification for acts which breach the article. <clears throat> the court constantly uh, is constantly quick to remind the states that the victim's conduct cannot be considered in any way as a justification for a resort to prohibited behavior. The court has often reiterated that even in the most difficult circumstances, such as the fight against terrorism and organized crime, the convention prohibits in absolute terms, torture and inhuman or degrading treatment or punishment. The absolute prohibition in Article 3 also means that it is not permitted to derogate from the prohibition even in times of war, but our colleague Verhavich is going to talk more about that. Uh, I would just like to uh, also emphasize that Article 3 imposes both negative and positive obligations for state parties. That is an obligation to refrain from certain actions and obligation to take positive action to adopt measures to secure individuals uh, their rights and to protect them from prohibited treatment. And now, talking about positive obligation, I'm going to give just a quick introduction and, um, on the scope of positive obligations and then I would like to focus shortly, of course, or because of the time, allowed to several aspects like protection of minors, gender-based violence, protection of persons deprived from liberty, and also health in connection of prisoners, but of course health uh, in context of Article 3 as well. And then finally, shortly about procedural obligations. So the doctrine of positive obligation has been advanced by the court in Strasbourg as a tool to safeguard and guarantee the rights purported by the European Convention on Human Rights. <clears throat> in the view of the European Court, the prime characteristic of positive obligations is that they, in practice, require national authorities to take the necessary measures to safeguard right. And this is emphasized in Hockenen versus Finland uh, back in 1994. Or more precisely, to take the necessary measures to safeguard the right, or more specifically, to adopt reasonable and suitable measures to protect the rights of the individuals which is emphasized in Lopez Ostra versus Spain. Positive obligations arise throughout almost all the rights protected by the European Convention. The wide scope of these provisions promote the engagement of states to intervene in a number of injustices which happen on a daily basis, and especially in extraordinary circumstances, circumstances state of emergency and pandemic. Uh, such instances include situations of child abuse, also human trafficking, slavery, etc. And the, the scope of a positive obligation, uh, the court has been inclined to limit this open-ended scope of positive obligations by requiring states to have knowledge of human rights infringements. This denotes that a state's liability is only in, connection, in the question when it is clear that the state authorities were aware or should have been aware that their intervention was permanent. Furthermore, when confronted with such claims, the court endeavors to consider the particular circumstances of the case and the vulnerability of the injured party. Uh, while Article 3 is absolute in its negative aspect, the fact that it is not <clears throat> reasonable to ex it is not reasonable to expect from the state that it can prevent any event of ill treatment by private hands. Uh, requires a further examination in which arguments against government action can be adopted. Specifically, in the context of Article 3, the scope of the positive obligation is limited by what can be reasonably expected of the state in the circumstances, in concreto. Nevertheless, this does not affect the absolute nature of the Article 3 right. The absolute terms of the guarantee prohibits any quali qualifying conditions under which restrictions may be legitimately imposed. 
As regards the positive obligations, it is a constant, it is a constant of a, the case law of the court that the obligation of the high contracting parties under Article 1 of the Convention to, secu to secure to everyone within their jurisdiction the rights and freedoms defined in the Convention, taken together in conjunction with Article 3, requires states to take measures designed to ensure that individuals within their jurisdiction are not subjected to torture or inhuman or degrading treatment or punishment, including such ill treatment administrated by private individuals. And this is actually uh, a reference to HLR versus France, judgment from 1997. Um, this requirement has both substantive and procedural implications. In its substantive dimension, it has been invoked to protect the most vulnerable persons, mainly children, detainees, and the, the close relatives of persons who have been who have disappeared. <clears throat> in the procedural dimension, the states are required to conduct effective investigations in alleged violations of Article 3, and we have been talking a lot about this aspect uh, throughout the region. Um, protection of minors uh, and the protection of women uh, in the context of domestic violence. Uh, let me tell you that the uh, first risk of imposing self-confinement is the increase of domestic violence. And several countries reported a rise of around 30% of domestic violence since the beginning of the crisis. On another hand, confinement particularly affects detainees. So uh, the COVID-19 crisis will especially uh, develop this uh, aspect, I would say, since uh, state parties, by taking restrictive measures, um, tackled um, or interfering in those rights, uh, and uh, they have to be aware of the consequences those measures may provoke. Um, because the court requires a minimum threshold of severity to be reached in order to engage Article 3, it is most likely that the uh, threshold, which depends on the nature and the context of the treatment, its duration, its physical and mental effects, and in some instances, the sex, age, state of health of victim have been considered. And this is what we have in Opus versus Turkey to be, re to be reached in relation to children uh, and adults. Um, so uh, the question of violation of substantive positive obligations stemming from Article 3 will arise in particular where the violation was rendered possible by uh, deficient and inadequately protective legislation. This was the case of A versus the United Kingdom. Then uh, also where uh, although the law offers sufficient protection, the authorities have been informed about the ill treatment but have uh, remained passive. Uh, failed to act, have not reached effectively or reached too late. This was example of the case Z versus United Kingdom. Uh, the COVID-19 crisis has provoked increased violence against women due to the confinement measures, liability of the states for not adopting measures which would prevent violence and ill treatment for victims of domestic abuse should be engaged again. Here, just uh, let me allow to mention um, uh, several aspects concerning persons deprived of liberty. Uh, uh, the protection secured by Article 3 also extends to them. Uh, the protection implies, first of all, that the authorities concerned ensure that the integrity of the persons is not harmed by others. Other important aspect is that the right of health of persons completely depend on public authorities, and this is found in Kudobin versus uh, Russia. Uh, we have more examples, and I hope that we can tackle them during our discussion. Uh, there is positive obligation of states to ensure health, uh, also in uh, context of out of prisons. And here we, let me just uh, emphasize that the European Court of Human Rights uh, granted an interim measure uh, ordering Greek authorities to transfer an old man from underlying health conditions, especially in light of COVID-19 outbreak, out of uh, veal hotspot and uh, provide him an adequate health care and assistance. And that is MA versus Greece, and that is from March 2020.
about effective uh, investigations. We talked a lot, uh, and I'm not going to take time. I would like just to emphasize that court has zero tolerance towards excuses for not conducting an effective investigations according to uh, European human rights uh, standards in connection to alleged violations of Article 2 and 3. And thank you so much for a little bit more time allowed. Thank you very much, Ivana, for um, rounding off this introduction to the positive obligations of um, the states generally under the case law of the court and in particular under articles two and three. And this now in a sense, and by giving the examples of impact in the context of article three, you've also provided the perfect transition to our next speaker who will in a sense address, you mentioned detainees, the immediate impact of confinement. And that's of course what most of us first think of um, in the context of the state's response to um, the COVID-19 and therefore, um, we're now moving to the negative obligation aspect. And the first speaker is um, Lady Bianco, the former judge elected in respect of Albania. And um, as Brianna said, the godfather of the forum. And I should add, um, one of the main contributors to this very useful guide, which um, I must say is a, is a very valuable tool provided by the Air Center and Civil Rights Defenders. So, um, Lady will talk to us about the right to liberty and security and the right to freedom of movement. Lady, the floor is yours. Thank you, Tim. Uh, the, I'll start right away because I know you, you started the content already. <laughs> uh, the quarantine, isolation, or other measures introduced to prevent the spread of COVID-19 since last March in several member states of the convention have clearly implied restrictions on the freedom of people to go out and to move freely. It is therefore, as Tim said, legitimate to ask the question if and when these measures constitute a deprivation of liberty or interference with the freedom of movement. I remember myself immediately after lockdown was adopted in France, sending a text to Lawrence Early, our former Jewish consul, and saying, hey Lawrence, is this deprivation of liberty of, or freedom of restriction to movement, of course, having, having an exchange with Lawrence in distance. Uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has once again uh, brought uh, to the fore the tricky question of where lies, uh, the line lies between the restriction of movement and deprivation of liberty. This question arises in an unprecedented situation where the entire population of a country is subject to such restrictions. So I'll address three uh, issues. The first is a deprivation of liberty. The, these measures are deprivation of liberty. The second are these restrictions to uh, freedom of movement. And third, very briefly, uh, some uh, safeguards to those two uh, uh, freedoms. Uh, first, do these measures constitute deprivation of liberty? It is true that deprivation of liberty can take many forms, for example, placing individuals in a social home, uh, the court has said in the case of uh, Haji Melic and others versus Bosnia and, uh, and Herzegovina, house arrest, Buzaji versus Moldova, uh, there's been this, this issue, or Deliorgi versus Albania, uh, where uh, house arrest was considered deprivation of liberty. Crowd control measures adopted by the police for reasons of public order, Austin and others versus UK, or confinement in transit areas, Amur versus France, or recently uh, Ilyas and Ahmed versus Hungary. However, the court has repeatedly said that, and I quote, the difference between deprivation of and restriction upon liberty is nonetheless merely one of degree or intensity and not one of nature or substance is the famous case uh, of Guzardi versus Italy. The court has also reiterated that house arrest constitutes deprivation of liberty. However, confinement at home of a person who is not authorized to leave his or her residence might therefore be less likely constitute a deprivation of liberty. The court, for example, concluded that house arrest of a person, except in case of necessity, between 10 p.m. and 6 a.m., did not constitute deprivation of liberty. 
is the case of De Tomaso versus Italy, the Grand Chamber case. Nor did a daily curfew of 12 hours on weekdays combined with a weekend curfew for 16, uh, only 16 months, the case of Trionis versus Lithuania. Then allowing people to leave uh, their residence for only one hour a day, as was the case in France and in many uh, other European countries, is clearly more restrictive than the nighttime curfew which was considered to constitute a restriction of, of movement, rather deprivation of liberty in De Tomaso. When these quarantine conditions include exceptions, allowing people to make essential purchases, visit family or exercise or go out, albeit only for one hour at the time of their choosing, to my opinion, these measures would be less likely to constitute deprivation of liberty. However, this general conclusion does not conclude that in, in certain more specific cases linked to the pandemic, Article 5 of the Convention may apply. I shall recall that Article 5 is the unique article of the Convention to mention infectious diseases, indeed. So there is no other article of uh, the Convention referring to that. Article 5 applies in a situation of detention of persons who can spread the COVID-19 virus. This situation is specifically provided by Article 5, Paragraph 1e, which authorizes the lawful detention of persons for the prevention of spreading of infectious diseases. These individuals must, might, may constitute a danger of public safety, and in some cases, detention would also be in their own interest. This situation is quite possible in the context of COVID-19 pandemic, which is the virus is infectious, is dangerous for public health and safety, and could be legitimate for states to impose under Article 5.1e the deprivation of persons of li their liberty in order to prevent the spreading. To this end, some member states had in place before the pandemic legal provisions which provide the possibility of providing, of depriving uh, persons of their liberty, uh, so persons who are likely to spread the virus. Others uh, adopted legislative changes for such pur purpose during the pandemic. The court pointed out in the case which remains the most relevant to this situation thus far, Enhorn versus Sweden, that detention is only permitted under this provision as a last resort when less severe measures to prevent the spread of the disease have been considered insufficient to safeguard public interest. It must be recognized, however, that the situation in, Henho in Enhorn was isolated. It remains to be seen, and this is the tricky question, how deprivation of liberty is engaged in a situation of continuously evolving pandemic with thousands of people being infected and who, who are potential sources of infection with COVID-19. In addition, regarding migrants and asylum seekers, for example, the measures taken to restrict their movements in response to COVID-19 pandemic have also included the massive confinement of individuals in temporary detention centers, preventing them from leaving these areas. The court pre previously found that the prolonged confinement in, air, uh, in airport transit zones pending the outcome of asylum applications constituted deprivation of liberty within the meaning of Article 5. Whereas stay in a transit area situated at land border was not because the applicants had the possibility to leave and return to the country they came from. So is Ilyas and Ahmed versus Hungary. Confinement in a reception, identification, or registration center for migrants would therefore constitute deprivation of liberty if there is no possibility of leaving uh, those centers. The second point I wanted to make is, of course, the freedom of movement. While the general lockdown and confinement measures do not seem to fall under Article 5 of the Convention, they've had a clear impact on the right to free movement protected by Article 2 of Protocol 4 of the Convention. The court found an interference with this right when individuals were under ha house arrest, so the case of De Tommaso versus Italy, uh, were required to seek permission from a court before leaving their home to go uh, elsewhere, Antonenkov and others versus Ukraine, uh, 
when they are prevented from crossing borders within the country in which they regularly uh, resided, is Timishev versus Russia, when they are pro prohibited from entering specific areas of a city or leaving from those areas, is Landvergud and Oliveira versus, uh, versus uh, the Netherlands. Or they could not leave uh, a specific, specific state. It can be argued that these measures taken to restrict movement in order to prevent the spread of COVID-19 constitute an interference with the rights protected by Article 2 of the Protocol 4, such, ours, for, such are, for example, the imposition of partial or complete quarantine requirements in a country, preventing people from leaving their homes for several days or at certain times, imposing more specific constraints such as a restriction on access to public transport or traveling except in very exceptional situations. The pandemic has also raised the unprecedented question regarding the right of nationals to enter the territories of their states of which they are nationals. And this is quite exceptional. There have been cases related to Albania, uh, Serbia, and, and Ukraine where their nationals were blocked at their, at their borders, sometimes at the territorial borders, sometimes because of the impossibility to fly back home. The third point, the safeguards. The pandemic has shown on one side how important are the safeguards in relation to these situations. On the other, has shown the amount of careful and speedy work that is needed by the authorities to make such safeguards work in a pandemic situation. The first of such safeguards is, of course, especially in relation to Article 5, legal certainty. Individuals need to know in advance the rules in order to be able to comply with them and to know the consequence in cases of breach. With the continuous and speedy evolving of the pandemic situation, state had and still have to take energetic, urgent, but also careful measures to comply with the principle of legal certainty. Not only the rules have to be updated continuously, but these rules have to be carefully drafted. I underline pre precision as a key element in order to avoid arbitrariness, which is one of the key elements for the, in the interpretation of Article 5 of the Convention. A critical element amongst the guarantees of Article 5 is, of course, the review of regularity of the detention. As we know, that should be a speedy review as required by Article 5, Paragraph 4 of the Convention. As far as freedom of movement is concerned, procedural guarantees has to, have to be in place to make sure the restrictions on Article 2 of Protocol 4 are provided by law, pursue a legitimate aim, and are proportional. Access to court, which will control how these safeguards operated and were respected or not during the pandemic, is the most important of these safeguards. The pandemic, however, has heavily compromised the operation of this safeguard as well. My friend and former colleague, Paul Lemons, Judge Paul Lemons will explain the operation of the court, and this is another huge problem uh, with the operation, which impacts, I might say, Article 5, but also all the other articles of the Convention engaged in this situation. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Lady, for um, <clears throat> tackling what is a huge area, the difficult distinction between um, deprivation of liberty and freedom of movement um, and, of course, the unique problems faced by COVID-19, including return of own nationals to their country um, and, and the difficulties of safeguards um, provided. The last speaker, as you indicated now, is um, Judge Paul Lemons, um, the judge elected in respect of Belgium, who will return to a topic um, President Spano mentioned this morning, namely the proper functioning of the court. Judge Spano mentioned it by reference to how we have adopted our working methods, um, and I think um, Judge Lemons will now look at, Paul Lemons will now look at um, the broader impact and the impact of Article 6 on Article 6 in the COVID context. So, Paul, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Tim. Dear colleagues, um, here and at the different hubs, <clears throat> it's a great pleasure for me to be here uh, able to participate in this forum, and I'm very proud that I'm also sort of uh, adopted as someone from the Balkans. I will speak about the challenges to the proper functioning of the judiciary during a pandemic. 
The pandemic has been characterized as far as the judiciary is concerned by closing court buildings for the litigants, for the public. And the question arises, how did courts deal with such a situation? Were they still able to hear cases, to deliver judgments, to perform the service of justice? And can public decision makers learn from the experiences of the last months? Can there perhaps be something positive that has come out of the coronavirus crisis for the judiciary? There are a number of issues that can be discussed here. Access to justice, the way that cases are being processed, the reasonable time of the processing of cases, but I have only a limited amount of time and so I will concentrate on the issue of hearings organized by the courts. The starting point for us is Article 6, Paragraph 1 of the European Convention that uh, guarantees the right to a fair and public hearing, but also states that access to the courtroom can be uh, restricted for the press and the public under certain conditions. A right to a hearing, that is an oral examination of the case, and a right to a public hearing. Should courts guarantee these rights in a pandemic? And if so, how? Let me mention three scenarios. The first one is more or less what we are used to, the public hearing in the courtroom. <clears throat> I would almost say public hearings as before, but of course in a pandemic it's not exactly the same because there is the pandemic. So it would be necessary to respect the necessary physical distancing within the court premises, which may require additional investments in the court infrastructure. The second scenario is the scenario of the remote hearings, video hearings. Let me look at these from the point of view of the parties to the proceedings and then also from the point of view uh, of the general public. For the parties of the for the parties to the proceedings, they still enjoy the right to a fair hearing. And there are three aspects that I would like to highlight here that are particularly important when there is video conference. That's in the first place the right to an effective participation in the proceedings. Video links or participation via a video link, they are not as such incompatible with the notion of a fair and public hearing, but it must be possible then that the party on the other side of the line is able to follow very well what is going on, to see the persons present in the courtroom, to hear what is being said, and also to be seen and be heard by the others. The, the guide on COVID-19 and human rights that has already been mentioned several times mentions a number of safeguards, including safeguards of a technical nature that can help ensure the fairness of uh, remote hearings. The right to be assisted by a lawyer is a second right that plays a role here. The lawyer can maybe be present in the courtroom, but what about the party, the client? Does the party have the possibility to follow what's going on? Does the party have the possibility to communicate with the lawyer? Does that party have enough time to communicate? Can that party communicate with sufficient guarantees for the confidentiality of their communication? And in the third place, the right to hear witnesses, um, the right to examine or have examined witnesses. That is also possible, of course, to be realized via a video link, but just like when the witnesses are present in the courtroom, uh, the prosecution and the defense must, like also the court, must in general be able to observe the demeanor of the witnesses under questioning and to form their own impression of the reliability of the witness. Then the other question is, what about the remote hearing from the point of view of the general public? It's important that justice is be done in a transparent way, that there is some regard from the public on what is happening. The court has said when trials were taking place in prisons, for instance, that's fine, 
But publicity means that the public must be able to know where the trial is going to take place and the public must have access to that trial. We could more or less transpose that to uh, trials via a video link. Does the public know that something will be going on? Does the public have an access to the trial? As Robert, the president, uh, indicated at the European Court, we, have, we do not have many hearings, but when we have hearings, they are nowadays with a video conference, and a few hours after the hearing has finished, the webcast is available on the website of the court. Let me turn to a third scenario, written procedures. In a number of countries, procedural rules have been changed so as to allow parties to proceedings, and it's mostly, if not exclusively, in civil and administrative proceedings, to have recourse to written procedures. That means that the court will decide on the basis of the documents in the file without having seen or heard the parties. How does that relate to Article 6 that guarantees the right to a public hearing? In a recent case of 2018, the Grand Chamber of the Court summed up the principles. It noted that it is generally important to have an oral and a public hearing, that Article 6 allows for exceptions to the, public's, to the publicity of the hearing in a number of circumstances, but then the court went on and said there are also other exceptional circumstances not mentioned in the text of Article 6 of the Convention which may justify dispensing with a hearing altogether. And the court gave some examples of situations. For instance, when no issue of credibility or contested facts arises, or when it's about purely legal issues, or when the case is about um, very technical issues, like in social security cases. A hearing, by contrast, may be necessary, quite necessary in very different situations, where it is necessary to check facts, to check the credibility of persons, etc. Most of the time, this is what is needed in criminal proceedings. All in all, the categories of cases in which an oral hearing is not necessary are not so exceptional. In quite many situations, a court could decide to, dis uh, could decide to, hear, to adjudicate the case without having to organize a hearing. So the question which is now raised, I would say very loudly after the pandemic is, is an oral and public hearing really needed in every case? <clears throat> and this brings me to my conclusion. The famous Dutch football player, Johan Cruijff, was known for an expression which he kept repeating. He said it in Dutch, but I'll say it in English. Every disadvantage has its advantages. And that is true for the difficult difficulties created by the coronavirus for the courts too. The challenges led to responses which were often new. They were probably intended to be of a very temporary nature. But these experimental responses can perhaps lead to more permanent changes. Uh, British author Richard Suskin is promoting very much the idea of online courts, and I think he poses the right question. Do we really need on all occasions to congregate physically to settle our legal differences? In a digital society in which it is commonplace to receive and provide all manner of services online, is it such a leap to imagine the delivery of online court services? Of course, this will require investments, creativity. But let us hope that the pandemic creates the basis for a new, a more efficient way for the courts to deal with their cases. A more frequent use, I would say, of written procedures, digital procedures, may lower the threshold for access to justice and may lead to the determination of more cases within a reasonable time. Let us be creative and optimistic. 
And I'm looking forward to hearing about your exper experiences in this area. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Paul, for um, en ending the contributions on a, um, on a hopeful note or a positive note um, in relation to what we might draw out of the pandemic in a, in a positive sense. And Article 6, of course, raises a whole host of issues, as you've outlined, and um, no doubt we will discuss some of them. Um, but it's one of the things that struck me was the interplay between ladies' contribution and yours in terms of client, lawyer, um, contribution, of course, one of the big difficulties is also getting access to detained clients yes. and actually being able to instruct lawyers properly in proceedings. But no doubt we will, we will discuss that. Um, I'm very grateful to all four of you to have stuck so tightly to the timetable. I'm sorry if I seemed a bit draconian as we went along, but that leaves us a good 30 plus minutes for questions. And um, if um, there are any in the room or actually have been communicated to Kreshmir or Hanna from the hubs, then perhaps we can have the roving microphone to um, pose some of those to our contributors. Thank you. Okay, so uh, uh, there were two interesting questions coming from the hubs. The first one is to all panelists and it concerns vulnerable detainees and the effects of COVID. In particular in Turkey there were some deaths in custody and the question is how uh, to react to this and how the society and judiciary should address this problem. The, sec the second question is about Article 3 and removals and extradition to other countries and the risk posed by COVID, uh, in particular in the context of identifying, uh, of course, real and immediate risk in the country of uh, destination. The last question was about Article 3 and extradition and removal context and the problem of real and immediate risk in the case of removal. Thank you very much. Perhaps we'll start with all of those. And the first one was addressed to all participants. So um, perhaps I will ask, um, start with Jovan, and we can work this way down the, down the table, if that's all right, <coughs> if, if there are um, a, a, any, any thoughts in response in relation to um, the question of vulnerable detainees and how um, one deals with issues such as death and custody arising in the context of um, COVID. Uh, as the first question, uh, duty to protect the life of those detained, uh, detained by the state, uh, uh, I, uh, these obligations uh, are within operational and uh, regulatory obligations of the state. Uh, this is in de details uh, explained in the uh, in the guide, but uh, I would only say that uh, the state has a duty to ensure that those who are deprived of their liberty, uh, it means uh, the persons uh, who are in prison, uh, who are in, in the detention centers, psychiatric uh, hospitals, and social care, uh, care facilities are provided with the requisite medical assistance so as to secure a person's health and uh, their well-being. Well, the, the question is very interesting indeed because uh, the imminent character of an infection in detention premises in a situation where it appears that distance safeguards are kind of the most common protection against passing on the, the, the virus is very tricky in the detention premise. And I'll start uh, probably, or better continue on what, on what Jovan uh, started with the analysis with the first question, 
is there a right of the detained and a corresponding obligation, positive obligation of the state for the detained people not to be infected with COVID. So for these people, under the control of the authorities, do states have a positive obligation to take all measures, masks, uh, distance, which means reallocation within cells. It's extremely difficult, which provides, we've, we've said in, in many cases, that uh, we, have to, to, we have to take care of, of, uh, of, uh, uh, of space dedicated to, uh, to detainees in prison and et cetera, uh, as far as the protection for, for detained people, uh, vulnerable detained people, the court has said, Kalashnikov, for example, that there is a positive du duty of the authorities to protect and to treat. So the first question is protection, not contracting the virus. The second one is medical treatment if somebody has contracted virus. And that goes with positive obligation, providing regulatory framework, uh, operative measures, as I said, providing masks, uh, start again, medical treatment, appropriate medical treatment again. So it is, it is another difficult issue. And the third one is in case of removal, I think was the, the second question. Well, you well, can speak about it. Okay, yeah. okay. Yeah. So I'm not going to, to I'm not mm -hmm. going to touch that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, can I just, uh, here, let me see. Yeah. And then you can take the just, just sure addition. Uh, I would only like to mention uh, the cases of Cyprus uh, versus Turkey and Christoph and others uh, versus Bulgaria in this context. Uh, in, in these cases, the court concluded that an issue may arise under Article 2, where it is shown that the authorities of con contract contracting uh, state have put an individual's life at risk through the denial of the health care which they have undertaken to make available to the population generally. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> I thank you to, to your questions because actually they um, uh, I w actually I planned to talk a little bit about that, but I didn't have time, so it's great. Uh, <clears throat> I have to actually emphasize here that states have uh, an obligation to restrict the spreading of transmissible disease. We have the case of Katalin Eugenitsu versus Romania. The applicant alleged he had called uh, hepatitis C while in prison and that the authorities had failed to provide appropriate medical treatment. The court found no violation of Article 3 prohibiting ill treatments because it was impossible to determine if the applicant's disease was the result of prison's authorities' inactions. However, the court indicated something <clears throat> instructive for future cases stating that the spread of transmissible diseases should be a public health concern, especially in the prison environment. Uh, we have, uh, in COVID-19 context, uh, we have also uh, uh, an aggravated circumstance uh, if the prison is overcrowded. And uh, in the context of pandemics, uh, which trigger the state's positive obligation to ensure right to health, especially in prisons, uh, where disease could be spread easily due to close contact, uh, the priority is to establish physical distance among prisoners. Here, I think it's beneficial, it's good for, for national uh, colleagues to actually uh, consult um, the Council of Europe's Committee for the Prevention of Torture and Inhuman and Degrading Treatment and Punishment, uh, which published a statement uh, of principles relating to the treatment of persons deprived of their liberty in the context of coronavirus disease pandemic. And this is from 25th March this year. Uh, <clears throat> as an example of uh, taking measures to preserve the detainees' right to health, the French authorities took emergency measures in order to facilitate the release uh, of detainees. Uh, 
Uh, and uh, actually, uh, on the eve of the country's COVID-19 lockdown, France had more than 72,000 people behind bars for prison, capacity of around 61,000. The emergency measures designed to contain the spread of virus have uh, reduced the prison population by around 10,000, bringing the occupancy rate close to the symbolic uh, threshold of one hundred percentage. So that's that's maybe a good example. And now I would like just to uh, mention, uh, in the context of your questions, uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, our case law uh, in respect of UK. So Tim is going we do to do the second question ah, in, okay. in a minute. We'll then, just do the first question yeah, okay, first, good. and then we'll come back to the second. Okay, thank you. Paul, did you? Is there simply because it was underlined the vulnerability of the of the people. So I simply refer to Valentin Campeano, Center for Legal Reform, and Valentin Campeano uh, as a, as an example. There are plenty of others, but that was a gun chamber case. Uh, as far as inmates are concerned, uh, it might be mentioned as well that only last week, 8th of October, the French Conseil d'État has taken a decision on uh, the, the detainees being obliged or of wearing masks or not. And they've done a very interesting analysis in that, in that regard. In what circumstances they would be obliged, uh, in what circumstances they cannot be obliged so for the authorities to take care of, of these elements, but that's, uh, of course, a long, a long decision. Thank you, lady. Perhaps one point to add, it strikes me, listening to all your answers, is also, of course, in positive obligations, we look at one, a risk you knew or ought to have known which of, of a victim, uh, which creates uh, the, what we call the Osman duty after Osman against the UK. But that, of course, is quite problematic in a prison context and in a in a um, disease or pandemic context, and it's reflected in the Romanian case you mentioned, yes. Ivana. Mm -hmm. um, and otherwise, you have to step back and look at whether there's a systemic problem about healthcare, and that then raises all the practical <coughs> difficulties you identified, Lady, about um, having to rearrange prisons which are already overcrowded to enable mm -hmm. distancing to happen, etc. So, some some difficult questions. Can I then perhaps move on to the second question, which related to removal to third countries and the real and imminent risk. And just to um, identify at the outset before I hand over to my colleagues that we have um, currently a case pending before the court called Hafiz against the United Kingdom in relation to extradition to the UK. So um, uh, th there, there is a limit in a sense as to how much we can say, but I, I wanted to just alert everybody to the fact that that is pending and under active consideration in the court, but now perhaps I'll start with Ivana and then work my way, and Paul, and then work my way that way. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Tim. I, I, I wanted actually to, <laughs> to mention the case from March 24th. Uh, the European Court of Human Rights, for the first time, communicated an application concerning COVID-19 uh, and an issue of detention. So the applicant, and please remind me, every, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but the applicant is 60 years old a uh, man and he's ill and currently in UK facing extradition to the US and uh, claims that in the context of COVID-19 where he would be exposed to a life sentence without parole, such extradition would be in breach of Article 3 prohibit, uh, prohibiting the human and degrading treatment. So, so it's the pending case. We cannot talk about it. We cannot, uh, but I would like to emphasize positive obligation in context of Article 3, that uh, actually uh, where release from detention is not deemed possible or appropriate, states should ensure that it is possible for persons who test co positive for COVID to be isolated away from other detainees uh, in conditions which are compatible with Article 3. So this is definitely new obligation under this pandemic. Uh, and uh, I think, uh, yeah. We can talk more. Yeah. Um, before I hand over to Paul, just to clarify, in Hafiz came to the court um, at a time when New York, which is where he was due to be extradited to, was at the height of its COVID um, pandemic. And therefore, the immediate question at the time it was communicated and came as an application for Rule 39 was, in fact, an imminence point there, too. So it wasn't.
wasn't only the question of his long term, if he were convicted, what is the COVID, imp COVID impact, but in fact was much more, the much more imminent question was, can he be extradited to be held on remand while waiting to come up for trial mm -hmm. in a context where, or to a city where the prisons um, were, so th the evidence suggested, were um, particularly affected by um, COVID-19 in a city that at the time was the, the hot spot in the United States mm -hmm. for, that, um, f for that disease. Paul. Thank you very much. Just a short answer. Um, the risk of be getting very ill in another country because of uh, coronavirus is certainly an element to be taken into account in cases of expulsion or extradition. I would like to refer to the case of Paposhvili versus Belgium. It's in the guide. Yes. Um, and I would quote from what the court has said in that case that um, Article 3 should be understood to prohibiting the removal from a country to another country where there are substantial grounds to believe that the person would face a real risk on account of the absence of appropriate treatment in the receiving country or the lack of access to such a treatment of being exposed to a serious, rapid, and irreversible decline in his or her state of health, resulting in not <laughs> a cough, but uh, an intense suffering or to a significant reduction in life expectancy. So that is a quite strict criterion, but it can be applicable in cases of expulsion or extradition. And what uh, yeah, the question was also, how do you know about the situation in the other country? Well, uh, the information has to be sought by the, the country that is preparing the expulsion or the extradition, uh, and if necessary, ask information from the third country. Can I just, before I hand over to, um, to Lady and, and um, Jovan, perhaps, of course, in Papushvili, the interesting thing is treatment and assurances, possibly. Um, and we're, of course, at the moment in a situation where arguably there is no treatment. Um, and it's difficult to see how assurance it would work. So how Papushvili works in the context of, of a disease for which there is no treatment, um, even if the threshold to engage Papushvili is, is, is met, um, would be one that I think will raise um, a whole host of new questions. And it's certainly not one without difficulty, Lydia. Just to continue on, on that point, because that was the issue in that line of case law, starting with D versus UK, N versus UK, SJ versus uh, Belgium, and etc., and Paposhvili, which seems to have clarified. But in all these cases, the situation was different because the level of treatment in the sending country and in the destination country was quite evident. Now, the question is that the two countries concerned it, there is no clear that there is difference, except from some medical treatments like, I don't know, aspirators or care or, or emergency beds in, in hospitals and et cetera. But then it comes the second question. Then most of the measures we have, referring, we have been referring to were taken by states like Germany, France, UK, and et cetera, because of the heavy burden on the health regimes. So can we say to a member state, you cannot remove that person to another state. You have to keep it yourself in a situation where you're already overburdened with your own citizens. So it's a very, it's a very tricky, it's a very tricky question, which will come before the court. <laughs> you'll, you'll see. <laughs> Thank you very much. Well, I hope that's, that's provided some answer um, to, to the question. Now, I don't know whether there are any more from the, there are, so um, if we could have the roving microphone back to Hannah and Krejimir, please, to um, um, give us the next set of questions. Give it to Krejimir, I think, and then we'll. The further question is very much linked to the topic that we now had, but 
the extent I understand it, it's very much statistical. So the question was about the interim measures issued by the court during pandemic uh, and the and how many applications did we receive during pandemic and what did they concern? Uh, so in terms if you if you don't have concrete numbers maybe we can you can say something in general about cases that were coming uh, and then there is a question by it would appear from Albania which was initially related to the restrictions on travel under article 8 and uh, article 2 protocol number 4 but then this question was uh, reformulated to a more general question on derogation. So I think we could answer I, our colleague from Albania in the afternoon session where Judge uh, Vehabovic will talk about derogation. So I think we leave this question for, for the afternoon session. So now for you is the issue of interim measures and applications received during pandemic. And, uh, and uh, if uh, uh, Lady can maybe just briefly say something about inability to travel and an issue under Article 5 and 2 Protocol 4. Should we start while we sort out the, the, the figures insofar as we have them? And I'm looking around the room too. Um, perhaps, Lady, do you want to speak about the travel restrictions briefly and then we'll, we'll come back? Well, in my, in my brief presentation, I was referring to the fact that travel restrictions are, are uh, fall uh, under Article 2 of Protocol, uh, Protocol 4. So there are no uh, considered under Article 5 of the, of the Convention. If I understood correctly, the question was directed into that line of, uh, that line of thinking. Uh, of course, the question has to be uh, assessed under the, the uh, typical uh, guarantees, paragraph 2 of Article 2 of Protocol 4 provides, and that we know, provided by law, uh, legitimate aim, and proportional. And all these principles uh, in the afternoon session will be dealt by, by, by Tim. Uh, however, the uh, specific difficulty, especially related to travel restrictions, in many member states, but some, I have the impression, did better than the others, because almost all of them had to act within few hours, following the ever-evolving uh, situation in relation to the pandemic. So the main question was whether the restrictions were adopted in conformity with the law, there was a law provided, then the specific decisions of the government, whether the, 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 the public was informed in due course and well in time in order to, to conform with this, uh, this, uh, these restrictions. And then, of course, is the question of, is it proportional or not? If you compare, for example, in the situation in France, we had a total lockdown in March where the government was saying we have 1,000 infections per day. And now we have only partial lockdown or kind of limitations, couvre-feu, between 10 uh, p.m. and 6 a.m., where you have 30 cases per day. So it's a very difficult exercise to, to, to be made. Huh? And, uh, and uh, those restrictions, of course, they have to undergo uh, uh, the judicial control in the country's concern before coming to the court, but it will be interesting to see their, their analysis, of, which has started. Conseil d'Etat in France uh, has, has started to, to, to give some, uh, some decisions in, in that regard. We'll see. Thank you, lady. Can I perhaps ask that we have the roving microphone because um, our president has kindly um, volunteered to answer the first question. So the question posed is one related to uh, interim measures, which are uh, examined and potentially applied under Rule 39 of the Rules of Court. Now that measure, as the concept connotes, requires a showing of irreparable harm. It is, in most situations, uh, a measure the court may adopt, may apply in, in, in migration cases, expulsion cases, deportation cases, and so forth. 
Historically, the court's approach in applying Rule 39 has been rather restrictive. Uh, the conditions are tight simply because an interim measure is, of course, uh, 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 an intervention by the court in, in, a, in, in a case which has not been examined on the merits and is based on a rule in the rules of court, which the court, however, has in two grand chamber judgment considered to in create a binding norm of international law. Since the, the, the pandemic started in March uh, and the confinement the lockdown was imposed in France on 16th of March, interestingly, uh, the Rule 39 unit of the court and our duty judges, who, which are usually vice presidents of section, which have a role as appointed by the president to deal with Rule 39 measures, have actually dealt with quite a number of cases uh, based on COVID-related or pandemic-related complaints. In fact, since March, upwards to 80% of the requests we have received under Rule 39 have been directly or indirectly related to COVID. However, in principle, the court, as I mentioned, has been very restrained in considering that uh, COVID as such in this context provides for uh, or fulfills the condition of irreparable harm. That is the situation about the practice in more detail. I would need to, we would need a bit more information before we could answer that in more detail. Thank you very much, Robert. Um, I, I think um, Ivana wanted to just make an additional point, which which comes from her previous life um, to some extent, and then I think we have one more question before we have to wind up this wind up this um, this session. Uh, thank you, Tim, so much. Now I'm just uh, I would just like to emphasize one important uh, aspect of, of all human rights, but very much important for protections of rights under Article Two, Three, Four, and having in mind Osmond test maybe Article Eight as well. So it's human dignity, inherent human dignity. We don't have a specific article, specific uh, provision in our convention. Of course, it is in the essence of all of our provisions. Uh, on the contrary, ICCPR in Article 10 has uh, an explicit norm uh, saying that all persons deprived of their liberty shall be treated with humanity and with respect for their inherent dignity of human persons. It's, in the, it's very connected with Article 3 or Article 7 of ICCPR. Uh, and I would like to actually invite national judges to read our recent jurisprudence, especially in Turkish cases and also other cases concerning Article 3, where human dignity is emphasized in our judgments. That's all. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm just um, checking whether there is uh, one more question. Um, the roving microphone. Thank you very much. Kozimir. Uh, maybe we can, uh, uh, there are no further particular questions from the hub, but there is something from what I have experienced in participating in several of uh, such events uh, during this period of pandemic. And I've seen that in many of these countries, uh, a problem have arisen due to the fact that the regulation, regulatory framework, which was several times mentioned, was basically not properly adapted to the current situation. It was not uh, uh, properly uh, prepared for a situation of pandemic. And therefore, countries were introducing different measures which the Venice Commission, in the report that the president mentioned, referred as de facto situations of emergency and so on. So what would be your, in general opinion, how the, 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 the courts should deal with such situations of de facto emergency and where is the, what kind of scrutiny by the courts should be applied to that situation? This is a very global question concerns absolutely every aspect of social life. Yeah. Sorry, we've seen this play out at national level quite a lot at the moment because it is the, the, the legality problem and whether there is a sufficient legal basis for um, 
forward the measures that are taken. And one actually sees, and I will refer to a few this afternoon, um, domestic courts using legality as the cutoff point of their analysis by saying, well, actually, there isn't a sufficient legal base at the moment because they are not sufficiently um, adapted. And that reaches across all, all the aspects of um, the pandemic. And courts, I think, also taking a prudent approach by saying, if the legislative basis isn't there, then it isn't really for us to go on and assess what the options are and do the very difficult weighing exercise that comes with a proportionality exercise, but leaving it to the legislature to, to, um, to take the remedial action uh, that flows. And, but one of the aspects, of course, is if you have a finding of no legal basis in relation to any measure taken or any interference, the consequential that arises from that, for example, in the context of um, of deprivation of liberty or freedom or restrictions on the freedom of movement, of course, becomes um, not insignificant. Those are playing out at the national level at the moment, and um, I, I suspect will take some time to wind their way through um, to us. So, um, looking at the time, perhaps I can um, ask Brianna to. Um, wind up this session, but let me just, as, as the second moderator, again, thank the panel for both their concise and clear contributions and for sticking to the time and um, for answering um, the questions in, in such a full and informative way, which I hope was helpful to those of you who are listening to us or watching us um, both at the other seven hubs and um, on the internet more generally. So thank you very much to all four of you. Many thanks, Tim. Um, echoing your words, thanking all panelists, and then thanking in particular Ivan and Lady for helping us put this all together over the last few months. Uh, before we move on to lunch, just to briefly explain how the afternoon will, will work, we will first have a panel uh, very similar to the one now, tackling different issues. And we encourage you to over lunch, discuss with your moderators, and they can then communicate questions related to the topics covered by that panel. Feel free also to, to nominate any other questions because we will have time to take those tomorrow at, at the last panel, which is very sort of open-ended and, and will be focusing on issues raised from throughout the region that we hear from your reports. Um, so please, sort of do, we are getting some questions already. We would love to have more. Um, so please do over lunch, um, use the time um, to direct some questions to the second panel. Thank you very much and see you all at two o'clock for the next panel. Enjoy your lunch.